I'm Jeff Skipper, and I'm pleased to welcome you to my third masterclass on the topic of leading change. Uh, this series is intended to take you beyond conventional thinking as we navigate these unconventional times. I've allocated 30 minutes for this, including some time for questions. We're going to end the session right at the 30 minute mark because I'm premiering a new video on YouTube at uh, 1230 local time. Um, I will show it on Zoom. So if you want to just stick around while that while that's happening, you're welcome to do that. Or you can switch around and watch it on your own screen if you wish, wish or pick it up later. Uh, I put everyone on mute and we've kept that locked down. So we'll use the chat in order to share any comments or questions as we go along. And this will be recorded. Uh, so those can review it later. Let's get started. So I'm starting more of my presentations now with a little bit of laughter. So this is for your consideration. And a big thanks to Jimmy Fallon for giving me some humor to start off the day. Storytelling. Here we have one of the typical stories that is out there. A 28 year old coronavirus survivor says he compares the disease to a car crash, left him unable to move on. Horrible, horrible. And, and we hear these stories and they're left with a, a significant impact. We carry this weight around. The more than we hear, the more that stack up and you can begin feeling a bit of hopelessness. So let me ask you, we're gonna turn the tables a little bit. What age do you think is the oldest person to have pulled through COVID-19? No checking Google. Uh, I'm only giving you a few seconds. So you got 102, 99, 95, 104, 93. No, no you're all wrong so far. Um, no, no, sorry guys. Um, okay, so uh, let's see what we've got here. Lots of answers here and, and someone did get it, we'll see. <laughs> So India's oldest COVID-19 survivor, 93-year-old man, and his wife, who was 88, uh, came through successfully last week. 97-year-old uh, in Brazil, uh, for that country, the oldest survivor. And 101 years old, so our first centenarian uh, to survive. Big thumbs up. Thanks, Keith. But we don't stop there. Bill uh, recently celebrated his 104th birthday and also proclaiming survivor of the 1918 flu, World War II, and now COVID-19. So that's, that's quite an accomplishment, beating out 103-year-old Zhang Wafan. Uh, but we don't, we don't stop there. The winning number is 107. So Laurel Benson, way to go in calling that out. Um, and uh, kudos to the Dutch. So out of the Netherlands, we have someone who's 107 pulled through this. Here's what's interesting. A, a lot of our days seem to start like this. There's this huge weight of negative news and, and, and scary charts. And it, it really does start to compound and weigh upon us. Um, but in doing this exercise of just looking at, you know, who's the longest lived? I'll tell you, as I went through and read each of those stories, and there were more of them at different ages, but, but several that were over 100, that lifted my spirits. It was quite encouraging and reminded me of the power of stories. They're so important uh, to us as humans. We're social individuals. We look to one another for evidence of, of what we should be thinking about, what we should what we should believe. One of the masters of storytelling in the corporate world is WestJet. Uh, they do a great job of capture and retelling. And this is submitted by uh, a pilot. He went down to El Salvador to bring back a number of Canadians who were stuck there. Um, and interesting in there, talks about the fact that these folks were really apprehensive. So they had been bumped from a previous flight, weren't sure they were gonna get on and get home. So even though the plane had landed, they're ready to board, still feeling anxious, and then began to get on the plane. And once physically into that space, I love the term here, the, uh, the tension began to dissolve. So now that we're physically in another place, I'm on the plane and there's no way you're getting me off this plane. I'm starting to feel a bit, little more secure. And then handing out the Blue Jays hats really capped it for them. Sorry, I had to say that. Um, and you see the smiles there. So a few things we take away from this. One is we have a story that's very positive being told. It brings in the emotional component of what was happening, the before and the after, that transition. 
and in um, doing the service for fellow Canadians. And it's being told by a pilot. This is not the WestJet corporate machine. Uh, this is someone who's felt motivated to write down what he was experiencing and share that out with other individuals. <clears throat> Long-term care is a special place in my heart, and I know we've got at least one person on the line uh, from that industry, uh, but this is a really, really tough time for them. Uh, we, again, negatives in the, in the media. And here's someone taking the time, April 2nd, to share their experience going back. This is from history. This is not during COVID, but sharing their experience of what happens on the inside. And for myself, I'll tell you, when you spend time in long-term care, you quickly pick up on the fact that the, the care workers do not refer to the people under their care as patients um, and, and not even as residents all the time. They call them family. There's a very deep connection there. And so while many of us are on the outside and, and, and their family members not able to visit and get inside, it's reassuring to hear these stories of what's happening on the inside and how care continues to be expressed by others when we can't be there physically. Um, I was interested in this story that came up 16th of March, so early on in the lockdown cycle, where the BBC picked up on this trend around caremongering. In, in the top right, you see scaremongering is a big problem. People are feeling panic. So we wanted to reclaim the term, switch it around, and come up with something more positive. This became a hashtag thread, and you had these Facebook groups popping up across Canada. Um, all the way up to Yellowknife and beyond of people using this hashtag to call out for help and for individuals to respond. This became formalized. So this article just coming out within, uh, well, yesterday, um, showing we've got this 1855 number so you can call in and ask for assistance, but still volunteer run, people offering help to one another. What's particularly interesting to me about this article, not shown here, but one of the individuals interviewed is a healthcare worker who says that on my days off, I'm going out to help other individuals that can't help themselves. I'm like, wow, here's someone who's already in one of the most stressful occupations of the moment who continues to do more. Why? Because it does give something back, and we're gonna dig into this. When I talk about storytelling within organizations in the context of change, I often contrast against what is typically done, and we see this kind of thing quite a bit. So here's some stats, here's some charts, and, and hopefully that will convince you. The reality is numbers are not nearly as effective as stories. The reason is because stories are able to do so much more. Here's what I recommend that we tie into their stories. So number one, individuals are always looking for self-interest first. It's not that they're being selfish per se, but we're naturally tuned into, is this change, is what you're offering me going to be a threat or an opportunity? So what's in it for me? But we don't stop there. Particularly today, people are looking beyond the help, the self-interest to heart to meaning, to purpose. It's what drives individuals to sacrifice their time, their money, to do something that's more helpful to others. We go beyond that, in fact, and in stories we can convey hope for the future. Even if I'm doing something that's not recognized, even if I'm doing something that not, is not gonna have an impact today, but might be recognized years from now, I'm interested in that if I can foresee it providing a benefit to our community, to our country, to the environment. So in telling our stories, we paint a picture of a future that people recognize that offers hope and also appeals to the heart, offers meaning. This is about providing a cause. So how do we tell our stories correctly? One, less is more. So less data, more story. That becomes more memorable, more impactful. We remember the elements of a of story, some of the details, but the meaning for sure, long after we recall a chart. We're not going to remember those stats, those numbers per se. Stories uh, stick with us. Second, Help, art, and hope. Those are the components you want to be able to embed in a story. And if you're starting to think, wow, that's a lot of stuff, you can do that very effectively. You don't have to name our strategic priorities. Name 
the cause. The story can illustrate that and people will draw it out. Capture what employees, staff, volunteers are doing now. One of my clients is in long-term care, so very near and dear to my heart. And in talking to them, uh, one of the recommendations I have is begin capturing what staff are doing now. Because in your future, when you're going through the next major change, it's extremely beneficial to have people look back and, and see, look how we adapted. We were forced to do it. It was extremely difficult, but we rose to the occasion. We have a history of success. Not that it was all perfect, but we can get through this. When I'm not working within a pandemic situation and I'm, I'm with organizations that are trying to drive transformation, the same thing applies. We want our employees to move towards a future. We're not there yet, but there are usually pockets or individuals within the organization that are already doing it right. So I ask them, go find those people. Where are best practices happening? And retell those stories to give examples and evidence to all the rest of the organization that this can be done. Uh, when lockdown began, and someone asked me this question in the registration, uh, he was asked, why did some people choose to self-isolate before the government put all these controls in place? And the reality is some folks are looking further ahead. They, they've already got hope in mind. They're recognizing that there's a reason why we might want to take action now, even if we're not being asked or ordered to do it. So uh, by capturing those stories and sharing them, we can inspire others to commit more than just comply. Credibility-wise, having those individuals tell their own stories of success has uh, much greater impact. Four, relatability. So this message, we're all in this together. Well, we can only get that point across by demonstrating how we're all in this together. We pick people that are representative of the population. We pick contexts or situations that people can connect with. And finally, you want to conclude a story with some kind of call to action. While many people will get it, it'll be obvious out of what, you know, what's being implied by a story, not everyone gets there. So a simple call to action demonstrating how people can participate or what they might choose to do as a result is beneficial when you're wrapping a story. Don't overdo it or you start taking away from the power of the story of itself, but something in conclusion that directs their attention specifically to an action is helpful. As a bonus item, not really a step, but consider the fact that telling negative stories can also have a benefit. We realize that when we only focus on the positive, uh, when we uh, shame and figure point around failures, people stop telling what they got wrong and that can make it worse. It can exacerbate a problem, uh, making it more difficult to fix. But when we share mistakes that have been made, how we made some errors in judgment, that signals to others, okay, I'm fallible, you're fallible, mistakes can occur, and now I feel open about sharing. And that has another big impact. Now we can learn from those failures uh, together. So, so storytelling doesn't have to be all positive. Consider, uh, you might have seen the video put out by Peloton uh, in December, just in time for Christmas. Uh, it depicts a husband gifting a Peloton exercise bike to his wife or significant other, who then goes through a year long process where she ends up saying, you know, my life is so changed, I've been transformed. But it communicated to most people that here is a sexist opinion of how relationships work, that a husband would say, you need this exercise bike, to a person who is actually already quite thin, wrong message. So we have to be careful, test it out, ensure the details don't cloud or conflict with the message you're trying to deliver, and address any discrepancies. So if the story is told in different ways or people are uh, in conflict around the details that may need to be ironed out so it doesn't draw away from your message. Consider the volume of contrary stories. If your organization has a long history of doing it wrong or mistakes or bad leadership, you're gonna need a, a, some pretty hefty, weighty, and a series of stories that say the opposite. And repetition will be required. But consider story burnout is real. Uh, over time, stories lose their impact. Folks begin to say, yada, yada, yada. I've heard this before and just doesn't move people like it used to. So stories need to be refreshed. 
uh, either by replacing them with new ones or finding a different angle. Here's something you, that you might not have considered. It grabbed my attention. Jonathan Haidt is an American psychologist, specializes in moral psychology, and points out in this physical copy of the New York Times, we have this wonderful article about a landlord waving rent for hundreds, doing this uh, uh, really altruistic um, uh, offering to those major benefit. What is difficult to make out is in the bottom right is another article that says, seized medical supplies to be given to hospitals. I looked up the article, here's the detail. This person has this huge, hundreds of thousands of pieces of medical equipment being hoarded, probably going to be sold for profit, and when the authorities heard about it, now confiscate it, making sure it gets to the right place. The point that Jonathan's making here is the juxtaposition of these two things enhances the positive message. We're so disgusted by what's happening with this hoarder that we lend more positive credence to the individual doing something right. Look at this in contrast to what's happening over there. So consider when you're delivering stories, putting them in context of something that's negative can help. Be careful how you do it. Again, we don't want shaming per se, depending on the story that's being told, but by contrasting, you can have a bigger impact on your positive story. So some cautions here, stories must align at the level of values. Consider, we're saying we're all in this together, but maybe there's limits. Uh, we recently had this story around 3M being asked to stop sending medical supplies to Canada. That does not sound very neighborly. And, and I know there are Americans on this call who would feel that too, that it's not what we wanna see happen. So we wanna be protective, but consider how far can your story take things? Because if there's a contradiction to your story and it's obvious, it will kill credibility and you have a much harder time getting it back. So check how far you can extend those values. Do they align with what people see as being right? Uh, as I mentioned, adjust, addressing any discrepancies, do your fact checking and avoid a message of control. I've spoken before about the fact that when we're asking people to do change, it can be difficult because folks see that as you're imposing on my own power, my ability to make decisions. Here's an example, it's a tough one, but it's recent. Uh, so Trump claiming I'm the final authority. What's interesting about this article is the US governance were, governors were already moving in a direction in alignment with where Trump is going. We want to ease up, get the economy back going, uh, put people back to work. But the expression that I will make that decision uh, it rests with me, immediately causes people to bristle. We don't want that kind of power being taken away from us. So good stories put control in the listener's hands. Uh, they, they finalize with action that you can take, uh, offer the choice for you to support it, even if you're not directly involved, or finding a way to contribute, even if you're not on the front lines. So here we have this individual who has repurposed his pizza oven to toss masks. He's actually making masks and finding that in the oven at a certain temperature, uh, the material he's using uh, is malleable and, and uh, creates this curve that's beneficial to the mask, which he can then send to the front line for healthcare workers. Now I have to say, uh, unintended consequences, I would not one of these want one of these masks and then be walking around all day smelling pepperoni pizza and salivating in the thing. But I love the spirit of what he's doing here. So offering a way for people to participate even if they're not directly involved. That makes your story powerful. This memo came out late last week and it's a different example of how to do storytelling. Check this out. This long weekend, many Albertans will reflect on the power of sacrifice for the greater good. Sentence number one grabs you. Barren public spaces remind us of what we're all giving up to keep each other safe. So I've got a visual and we're in this together. Prioritizing lies over livelihood, a weighty reminder of how deeply we're all connected. Our members are looking for the good and embracing the simpler things in life. Now check this out. Homemade baking being left on friends' doorsteps. Children are discovering the joys of pen pals. Extended families are sharing meals over video conference. You can visualize each one of these things. In a single sentence, I'm communicating volumes in terms of giving and self-sacrifice and connectedness 
And I remember that even more so than the powerful words that came in paragraph one. And the cap on it, it's about feeding the soul. Beautifully written. I won't go through that last paragraph, but going on to say, we've got even more stories. They're captured in video and, and vignettes that are available on their website. But this transformed what is a fairly long text-based message into something very visual and compelling. So a different way of story storytelling using these mini stories, but extremely powerful. One final word around this, the importance of solidarity. If you don't recognize this, this is the shot of the uh, Niagara Falls um, uh, at the border. And on the left, we have the Merritt. So the Merritt decides we've got all these open rooms, let's light up some of them so it forms a heart, which sends a clear message to individuals, the powers of symbols that we care. Within days, all of the other hotels pick up this theme and do something similar, getting these hearts onto the into the windows to, to communicate to people, we care. We saw, th saw something similar to this when we had the accident with the Humboldt Broncos hockey team in Canada. Uh, so many individuals put a hockey stick on their front step or at their office to show somehow we're not directly involved. We can't connect with those families directly, but we want to demonstrate solidarity Telling stories about how we can be engaged enables people to participate in some way and giving them even a simple way to demonstrate that is very, very powerful for uni uniting people in a direction. Concluding thoughts, collect stories, start now, and share stories that uphold and uplift values. And finally, use them to direct action while enabling choice. Um, I'm going to take your questions in a moment. I want to finish with a quote, again, from Jonathan Haidt, the American psychologist, who I thought said something just brilliant. This is a time for us to reflect and choose a better story. Right now, stories are being rewritten all around us, nationally, individually, and we all get a chance to do some of the rewriting. What is the story you will tell? Questions. While you're thinking about it, um, I posted it a couple times. Uh, let's see if I can paste it again here. But a couple of free resources that recently came out. Um, again, I'll be doing this premiere in a moment on YouTube. This video, just three minutes long, gets at these aspects of help, heart, and hope. And I'm doing that because folks may find it beneficial to share that around. Uh, again, something free, but I found really resonates with leaders. Um, ebook that came out, uh, I was featured in 30 Steps Your Business Can Take Today to Be Prepared for Future Success. So again, this theme of, of working beyond lockdown. Uh, what do we do looking forward? Uh, that's there at, uh, at the Consulting Society. The link I just put in the chat area takes you directly to the press release and how to get a copy of that. So all free. Uh, I don't see any questions coming in. So here are a few that came in for registration that I can address, some really thoughtful items. So first of all, overwhelm. How do leaders choose the right amount of communication, the platform and the content during these early days of working remotely? Great question because email is saturated. So a couple thoughts I had. One, brand what you need to say. So if you're gonna have a consistent theme that you're updating people on, so whether it's pandemic related um, or it's uh, the most positive news you can imagine, you know, or your smile break, have a consistent title for it, you know, if, if necessary, drop an emoji in the subject line so people can easily identify it around the barrage of email that they're getting. Um, also, whenever possible, go live. So be in person, whether it's via video or whatever, uh, it's helpful for people to see another smiling face. Uh, someone's asked, uh, what are some elements of a story that may make it lack credibility? Uh, Laurel, great question. I just had this came up with an organization where we were creating a storyline. I said, by the way, based on the pandemic, are you going to be doing any layoffs in the next week or two? And the answer was yes. And I said, then don't tell this story yet. Because the, again, the juxtaposition of those two things, we're looking forward, we're trying to be positive, and some people are going to lose their jobs. 
does not jive. So be very careful around other events happening at the same time, which may jar the credibility of the story you're taking. Also consider the sender, the individual. Do they personally have credibility to relay that story or should it be someone else? Sometimes even bringing someone from outside the organization uh, can be helpful. Consider the power of influencers on social media. Uh, and, and those are folks we don't necessarily know, but they have a lot of influence, so what they say matters. So good question. So credibility, very important consideration in stories that are delivered. Uh, feel free to type in some more. I'll take the next one on my page here. How do I enable my own change? Uh, this is a great one, and I was thinking about this in context of our, our seminar today. That was seek out other stories. We tend to do this naturally around, you know, what are you experiencing? What are you feeling? But in my experience of looking online around, you know, these folks who have conquered the virus, uh, that can offer real hope. They resonate with us. So seek out stories that uh, uh, really will aim to move you in a certain direction. Ask for other people's experiences. Uh, why are change leaders willing to demonstrate their commitment to the same transformation they're asking their audience to embrace? Uh, can I hear an amen to that from some people out there? <laughs> this does happen and uh, not related to our topic today, but I thought it was such a great question. Uh, response number one I would offer is that they're just not bought in. Uh, so uh, someone said, the reason why we do things is because we are either moving away from pain or towards, towards something with pleasure. It's the idea of the self-interest, what's in it for me. But this individual, if they're not uh, willing to demonstrate their commitment, there's a, a fear component that if I do demonstrate it, something bad is going to happen, or there's not enough pull. They're not seeing the benefit for them personally. When I'm doing change work with an organization, I do not only ask what's in it for the organization, what's in it for the employees. I ask what's in it for the sponsor or the leader personally. What happens to their reputation if this is a success or a failure? What do they have to lose? So tapping into that allows you as a change lead to try and create an environment that will motivate them as well. You have to understand what's driving them. Uh, George, if you're a leader, then lead. People aren't sure if their way will expect that from you. Absolutely. Uh, I've seen sponsors appointed that were about to retire, zero commitment. It sends exactly the wrong message and people don't get engaged. We need individuals to step up. Uh, final question here. As a change manager, how do you deal with an abrupt shift in strategy by senior management? Great question. You need all the details. So uh, <laughs> I guess the bottom line here is ask lots of questions. So the who, what, when, and where, and absolutely get to the why. It's okay for you to ask, tell me the reasoning. When senior management does an abrupt shift, for them, I guarantee it was not abrupt. The thinking was percolating in their minds for at least days, if not months, and per perhaps years. They just haven't revealed it until now. So your main question is, take me on the journey with you. How did you arrive here? Because part of your job is to relate that rapidly to everyone else in the organization. Here's the sequence of thinking that gets us to this point. Great questions, folks, and keep them coming in. So uh, before I switch over to YouTube, Reminder, our next session is on April 17th. Most of you have that invite already. I'll send a reminder out. But this one is shaping up really nicely. I have to admit, I'm pulling in resources from a number of places because there's some great stuff out there. But focusing on our mental health is extremely practical these days. Uh, so we'll look at how you can do that to rebuild capacity. And I hope you will join me.